I've been playing saxophone for 32 years. Then I started engineering about 2002, but then I went to school for it in 2004. So my affiliation with State Services for the Blind goes a long way back. You know, I had an instructor who told me I, he didn't think I'd go very far because of my eyesight. Brian Powers, musician, engineer, teacher, and client at State Services for the Blind. What I loved about State Services, though, the most is that they really narrowed it down to focus on what you really need to be productive. Just don't be afraid to use the services that are out there. I guess that's my biggest, I don't say it like three times, but but it's true. We're, you know, we, we're so afraid of looking for help. We think it makes us look weak or we think it accentuates our disability. Sometimes we're too you know, blinded by trying to be independent that we refuse to ask for it and end up shooting ourselves in the foot. It's our pleasure to present professional saxophone player, engineer, Brian Snowman Powers. And for more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at blindabilities.com, on Twitter at blindabilities, and download the free Blind Abilities app from the App Store. That's two words, blind abilities. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. Brian, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming over and joining us here in the studios. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff, for doing this. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, But really, the thanks does go to you. Hey, Brian, can you start it out by telling us how you got affiliated with state services? My affiliation with state services for the blind goes a long way back. So from Louisiana originally. You know, I've been a musician all my life. The great thing about musician and and being a jazz musician is I'm an improviser. So because even, you know, sight reading is tough with our, uh, you know, our vision. No, so state services from Louisiana actually helped me go to a jazz conservatory in New York back in 1995, which was amazing. So I actually went to the best jazz conservatory in America for performance. And then I, I toured for many years. And then when I had my kids, we decided to stay closer to home. And we ended up moving out here to Minnesota because this is where my ex-wife's family is from. Then I actually started engineering as a way to stay around home more. And then state services actually helped me go to school for that at IPR here in Minneapolis. And then I opened my own studio in my house for a little while. And then uh, I ended up uh, changing businesses and expanding. And then the current state services with Brianna helped me get new gear and, and get some equipment for starting up my own studio. And actually now I've expanded into a building in Uptown, which has actually been really nice. So we're actually building that out now. But all the core gear that I needed to get and some things for my site, including like a nice touchscreen monitor and a, a desk that had all the equipment closer to eye level, right? I didn't have to bend down under because most studio racks and gear are in racks and they're behind you or underneath. Well, this special desk that we got actually has the rack gear on top, which makes it easier to see. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've been dealt with state services about three or four times throughout my career. And gosh, it's always been like amazing, like the amount of help and the amount of support and the, to help us. Because, you know, with our disabilities, it's hard to get normal jobs in general because people, you know, everybody talks about non-discrimination, but uh, you know, all the racial tension going on today. But let's face it, handicapped people still probably discriminated the most against, even if you can fulfill fill the job requirements. You know, the first thing to do is look at what they have to do to accommodate you, and then they don't like that usually. So I have albinism. That's my disability, which gives me drastic nearsightedness. My eyes move, so focusing is a problem. And of course, the sunlight is my mortal enemy, <laughs> and, uh, which makes the music industry great because we do most of our work at night anyway. So there you go. So what was it like when you entertained the idea of going to engineering school? So when I first uh, went to recording school, which is when I first used the state services from Minnesota, I believe it was my sister who's also uh, legally blind. So they helped with some low vision aids. Got me hooked up with an eye doctor that really specialized in low vision. We did contacts and things like that. But so my sister actually is the one who initially had found out the information and given it to me. And then when I needed to change and, and do a new business, I actually just still had their number. And of course, the caseworker wasn't there anymore. It was somebody new. It was Brianna. So, Brian, how tough was it to get Brianna on your side? Well, as far as uh, that round went, it was actually reasonably easy with Brianna because uh, I had already established that what I was doing was a viable career. And Brianna is your state services counselor. 
Yes. It was actually, it wasn't too bad because I think Brianna also had had a, I think it was a family member or someone close to her who also had a studio or something of that nature. And so she had already kind of had an idea about that particular job and I'd already been doing it for gosh, seven or eight years of making a living at it. And I was uh, changing and forming my own business out of uh, and leaving a partner I'd had. So uh, it, was a, it was a new business that I was starting. But so yeah, that actually wasn't super hard. For me, writing the business plan was interesting because I'd actually never sat down and wrote an official business plan. And I think my first one was like 40 pages long or something like that. She also helped me hook me up with like small business services and places where I could get information about setting up a proper business plan. So the hardest part about that particular round with state services was just getting all the details in order, things that I hadn't done before, but Brianna was super great. She even, you know, helped me write the business plan as far as editing it for me, making sure that it, it fit the criteria. And uh, But actually convincing them was really easy because of the proof that I'd already made a living at it. And then with all the market research I did as a part of the business plan, the state service certainly felt it was a viable, you know, business opportunity. Well, good job on that. How about when you're going for school for engineering? The first time I ever did it with going to school for it took a lot more convincing. And I don't know if the criteria had changed much because obviously these had been several years apart. When I first came to state services and went to school for recording, I had to really go in and prove that being an engineer freelance, you know, uh, could be um, profitable. And uh, because anything in the music industry or the arts, whether you're an author writing a book or whether you're a performer or whatever, is certainly hit or miss. It depends a lot, not just on your ability and talent to do it, but your understanding of being an entrepreneur, you know, and then with a handicap of some sort, knowing how to overcome that to achieve what you need. Well, in the music industry, being having albinism, um, I actually have a nickname, they call me Snowman. It actually helped image-wise uh, a lot with my career. To be honest, uh, albinism actually works in my favor because everybody likes a, a cool image or a unique look, and I definitely have that. Yeah, so it was a little tougher then to get funding to go to school for engineering because, again, it's not like a normal nine to five job that pays X. You had to kind of prove that it could be a source of income for a living. So that was a little tougher. But as you mentioned, you had been doing it, making a living off of it. Now, Brian, with respect to services, take us back to K through 12 and tell us your, your experiences. Oh, sure. Schooling was interesting, so I'm 42. So I was in elementary school, junior high and high school in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, things were different then than they are now as far as site and state services go. Plus, I was living in Louisiana, and I don't know how different funding is from state to state. You know, I'm sure it is. Back then, originally they had wanted to send, if you had some sort of disability or blindness, they wanted to send you to a blind school where they actually blindfolded you if you had sight so that you learned how to react and interact without sight at all. And that's how they trained you. And I actually refused to go because I had sight, even though I'm legally blind, and I wanted to learn how to use what I had. Back then, they trained you, if you're legally blind, they trained you as, as if you were blind completely. Lisa Louisiana. <laughs> I had a counselor who was with me during all my years of schooling, and she got me large print materials when I needed them, taught me Braille and those different things like that if I needed it, worked with me on, you know, those various things. So as far as devices, now, when I was in junior high and elementary school, I used large print books a lot or Braille books. When I got into high school, obviously with all the class load, and, and it was just too many heavy books to carry around, because I don't know if you remember what those large print books were like, but they were like huge. Oh my gosh. And like, they'd come in like, you know, 12 volumes from one book, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, so just, I guess, visual aids like that, uh, you know, they even offered to let me drive if I use that little telescopic lens that they have, you know. Um, I refuse to do that because I don't think you have enough peripheral vision to drive, even if you could pass a test with a little telescope. So I, I won't do that. Um, I feel like that's dangerous. The biggest thing nowadays, though, is our phones. And in fact, uh, one of the guys here told me about the Over 40 app, which I actually used for magnification, which is amazing. And then I'll use my camera on the phone for zooming to like, you know, watch things that are far away, like sporting events or whatever, even television sometimes. So the phones now have replaced a lot of adaptive technologies that we would have used. Um, I do have a the, the closed circuit camera TV thing that I use for reading like bills or small print, things like that if I have to. But in high school, the, the biggest problem, in, in junior high, that kind of stuff, the biggest problems I always had was bullying, you know, those kinds of things. And that was always, uh, you know, an issue until, uh, you know, you work on your own self-esteem and then if you take yourself more seriously, then people start to take you more seriously. And actually my nickname came from a band leader. People used to call me Frosty the Snowman when I was a kid to tease me. And he actually 
nicknamed me the snowman and turned around, put me on stage as a musician. And then it kind of turned around all the all the bullying because now it was like a cool thing. You know, it's, it's something that was uh, a positive name, I guess, you know, when it comes to mm-hmm. my career choice and everything. So, uh, yeah. So high school, I, I had some help. They also kind of taught me how to be independent. And uh, then I ended up going to New York for college, which... You know, blind man on the streets of New York, wandering around, you know, it was it was a challenge, but it was great. And now you're starting or enhancing your engineering company. What is it like on a day to day basis being an engineer in the music industry with a visual impairment? Well, engineering is uh, is interesting because obviously we have to do a lot with computer work, a lot with uh, consoles and wiring. So there's some things I can't do. For example, I can't solder cables together, although they they even use magnifying glasses for that. I have to, have to get so close, I'd probably burn my nose off with solder. <laughs> or melt like a snowman. Or, yeah, exactly. So I just, a lot of times I just have to look really close. Like if I'm working on a large format console, which has a lot of little bitty knobs and buttons, it'll be words written. A lot of times I memorize where things are. Obviously having a visual problem uh, helps you with your memory because you have to do a lot of things by memory, by touch and feel. So a lot of times I'll either just literally lean over the console, look really close until I have things memorized where things are that I just kind of know where things are. Um, but when it comes to um, things I really have trouble seeing, I'll use, you know, the uh, zooming feature on my phone or the Over 40 app. When I'm, you know, wiring up gear and I'm underneath you know, or behind, you know, the desk, uh, do a lot of wiring and stuff, I'll definitely use, uh, you know, zooming features and that kind of thing so I can read what's going on and see stuff in the dark. So it's it's definitely a little cumbersome to have a device with you. But again, in today's age, the, the cell phone has become just an indispensable tool for visually impaired. Brian, you mentioned the Over 40 app for your iPhone. Can you explain to our listeners how you utilize that app yeah i guess it was i don't know what it was originally meant for i'm I'm sure it the name says it all like for people who uh, adults who vision starts going bad for us what it is it's uh, it allows for magnification well beyond what like your photo fo- your photo your picture thing could do plus of course you have the flashlight involved and it's got a little bit more of a stabilization feature than your camera does so when you get super zoomed in you know you can be pretty shaky um, it works on that a little bit too and it focuses better the more you zoom so unlike the camera which will kind of get blurry a bunch as it's trying to focus in on something so it's got a lot better features for zooming in really close and that combined with the light plus you can it can take pictures if you need to take a picture of something and then uh, take a look at it later but yeah it's it's more a more enhanced zooming tool with better stabilization well great we'll put a link to that in the show notes brian for someone who is interested in a musical career or engineering what advice would you have for them First of all, just the industry itself is an entrepreneurial style industry. Um, you have to go get what you want. You have to go get your work, whether you're handicapped or not. Even you know, regular sighted people or whatever have to uh, work really hard at conducting business and getting clients and that kind of thing. And if you are going to work in a facility like a studio or go to school for it, you will need some sort of aid, especially if you're working on consoles. And a lot of times the screens will be far away from you because a lot of people like to put the computer screens like up on top of things or just out of the way of the gear. So you know, when I went to school. Um, I had them adapt, uh, even when I taught school, use the uh, monitor arms. That way the, the computer monitor can be moved around. That way when, when people who don't need it close can have it further back. And then when I need it up close to my face, because even with glasses or contacts, I still need the computer monitor right in my face. There's just no way of getting around it. So uh, those monitor arms were very, very useful for that. And I even just went and purchased a small little $100 standalone monitor that just sta- that just sits. That way I can put it right next to me all the time. So being able to find a way to get your computer screen close to you is a big deal because you will have to do a lot of computer work. And then in the studios, if you actually get a job in a studio or you're in school learning studio equipment, you'll definitely need to learn wiring. You'll have to be able to be in dark places and still you know read the backs of the gear. So you'll need some sort of magnifying you know device with a light. And even working with large format consoles, it helps to have that as well. Get your memory up. You'll have to memorize where things are on a console a lot. It helps a ton. It helps keep you from sweating and having to lean over so much. <laughs> but a lot of it comes down to just dealing with gear that has a lot of small buttons and a lot of small writing. Now, because the music industry is based on hearing, I know a lot of people who have sight issues have really good ears. That's one reason why I make a good engineer. I can hear distortion and sound that people don't even realize is there. So use that, you know, to your advantage, of course. But there are a lot of sight obstacles that uh, you'll have to overcome as far as computer placement, things like that, and gear placement, uh, because things are designed for people with sight. And I know that uh, every school and every school I went to and every school I worked at, especially in the modern era, everybody's been super accommodating, even offering to, you know, make stand desks that rise and fall, you know, for me or whatever. So obviously, generally, 
in the job market, people aren't as accommodating as far as getting a job. But typically with the school system, they're, I find they're very accommodating for making large print materials, especially if college law instructors use PowerPoints or they'll use uh, things up on a screen, you know, as far as their studies and lectures. What's great about the modern educational system is a lot of them use internet-based services to put their material up for the students to study. And most all those PowerPoints they use in lectures, they usually put up on those internet sites for you to, for as a student resource. So when we used to have to have people transcribe for us what was on a chalkboard or what was on a PowerPoint. Nowadays, instructors are putting that up on the internet for their students to use to study. So that, a lot of that has been uh, taken care of, which is nice. You're also a teacher. Yes, I've taught it. I've taught for about uh, nine years. And in what area did you teach, Brian? Um, I've always taught saxophone privately, uh, but I actually worked for Minneapolis Media Institute for a while, and I worked for Medallia Smith College of Music. And uh, I taught recording, production, uh, audio mixing, uh, audio editing. I taught post-production for film and video. I'm a certified pro tools expert, which is a, the main software used for recording, you know, uh, songwriting and composition and different things like that, music theory. McNally Smith, that's a highly sought after school for musicians. Well, no, and they just closed, unfortunately. <laughs> that's That's been the big news. Actually, I was on CARE 11 uh, on Friday about it. It was a sudden closing. Uh, they formed all of us, in the faculty and student body, Thursday evening last week. And uh, it was the day before payday, actually. It said that we weren't getting paid. The school was closing. So a lot of us had to go in uh, for free to actually make sure the students finished the semester, got their grades, so they even got the credits they paid for. It was a big deal. But uh, there are other schools here still, uh, like IPR and uh, Hennepin Tech and some other schools are still doing that kind of thing. And all across the country, there are a ton of music schools out there and production schools. But yes, I've I taught with McNally for three years. So Brian, it's obvious that I'm going to ask you to get me some music that I can put down for the this podcast. And it's going to be obvious that you do play saxophone. Yes, that's that's what I initially uh, have been doing since I was uh, eight. And uh, I had my first performance six months after I started playing. I played Silent Night for the school and got a standing ovation that was hooked. Performing is still my, my favorite thing to do. Um, I, I still gig a whole bunch. You know, that, that was my first source of income for a long time. And, uh, you know, worked out in New York for a long time. Uh, played with, I played with Dave Matthews and the Spin Doctors, and, and I toured with the Samples and uh, a bunch of different groups like that and here in town. I play a lot. Uh, I've played with a lot of gospel groups. Uh, Darnell Davis, Excelsior. Uh, played with people from the Sounds of Blackness. Uh, played with Wayne McFarland. And just a bunch of, I play the group now called the New Primitives, which is a reggae group. And I play with uh, a group called Chase and Ovation, which is uh, an 11-year Prince tribute group, actually. And that's still my favorite thing to do is to play and again with eyesight you know it all comes down to whether you can hear whether you know how good you can play and we can play what you hear that kind of thing and having bad eyesight never has really hurt me as far as being a musician that way you know sight reading like i mentioned earlier was always tough but you find ways around it i can pretty much play whatever i hear and that comes from training up your ears and stuff but yeah that's that's part of my income too oh yeah <laughs> I have a hunch that you do know Baker Street. Yeah, the song? Yeah. Yeah, I get that request all the time. That one and uh, Bob Seger turned the page, of course. Careless Whisper is another one that people love to hear, that melody. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I've learned all those famous sax lines because people just, you'll just be sitting at a grocery store and somebody's like, oh, saxophone, yeah, Baker Street, right? Or something. And you're just like, yeah, you know. Those are all great songs, though. Mm -hmm. Absolutely great songs. So that's like modern day saxophone player. Like when I start thinking of influences or people, People who played the sax. Uh, Charlie Parker comes to mind. Uh, he is uh, one of the best known bebop jazz musicians. Jazz had many different eras to it. You had swing, bebop, hard bop. You had you know the avant-garde period. You had actually jazz and classical kind of mirrored each other in uh, the different phases of, of the music that was made. Although jazz happened really fast, for classical it took centuries to happen. It evolved. But um, but Charlie Parker was definitely a big influence. Uh, him and John Coltrane and uh, Cannonball Adderley was actually one of my favorites. But uh, you know Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie really brought in the bebop era. They they took swing music. And brought it up to a whole new intellectual harmonic level. And actually, that's when jazz kind of got away from the listener because jazz used to be the pop music of the day. That's what people listened to. But when bebop came around and Charlie Parker, those guys played everything so fast and almost too much for the common listener to understand, it became a musician's music then. But love Charlie Parker, uh, you know, his uh, song Donnelly, which we still think Miles Davis actually wrote, but he claimed it anyway, is, uh, you know, great great influence on a lot of the playing and stuff. But, you know, these days as a musician, you have to be able to do a lot of things. You have to be able to play jazz, funk, R&B, rock, depending on what you get hired to play. Well, flexibility creates opportunities. 
So Brian, you mentioned bullying earlier. Now, is that something you'd be comfortable sharing with our listeners? It was hard. I mean, uh, and it was really mainly from uh, probably like fourth grade through ninth grade that it was the worst. You know, people would throw metal screws at me. They would line up. They would they would get in a circle around me and take turns hitting me because I couldn't really see who was hitting me. That kind of things. Like it was it was kind of cool to pick on me, I guess, or anybody with handicaps back then. Where today things are a little different with bullying in school. They've definitely made some uh, some great strides forward. It still happens, but they've definitely been more sensitive. Back then, you know, the more complaints we would raise, the more I would get in trouble about it. The teachers would just be like, well, just deal with it, just kids being kids. Yeah, things are different, man. Uh, you know, it, it definitely, uh, I still have insecurity because of it. You know, I've, I've never done the whole therapy thing, but uh, I know what my issues are. <laughs> but definitely, you know, it gives you an insecurity problem. Like, uh, even today, like, you know, no matter how much practicing I do, how good I get, I'm always worried about, oh, do people really like what I do? You know what I mean? There's always that insecurity about mm-hmm. yourself. I've, I've gotten more secure in my looks, though, as as I've turned my image of albinism into part of my professional image. That's that's gotten a lot better. People still look at me kind of funny sometimes when I'm walking around, but now it might be because they actually see me on stage somewhere more than just the fact that I look different. So I started celebrating the fact that people thought I was different rather than fearing it like I used to as a kid or wanting to be normal, so to speak. And nowadays, let's face it, normal has changed. Um, everybody's a little weird nowadays, so it's 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 different. You know, it did drive me to be more independent, though, I think. There was always a particular stigmatism, I think that's the right word, attached to, you know, any kind of handicap or handicap devices. One of the reasons I stopped using large print books, and I didn't, I didn't say this earlier, but was because I, didn't, I was tired of people looking at me straight what I did or having to have a special desk that was over the size, you know, bigger than the other students' desks because I had to have all that big material or big magnifying glass. I wanted to be as normal as possible. So I started using just what everybody else was using and just kind of try to figure my own way out through it, which I don't know if that was the smartest idea. Like even nowadays, people sometimes don't realize I even have an eyesight problem because not that I try to hide it, but just in my day-to-day caring of myself, I got so used to trying to hide it when I was a kid that I guess I got kind of good at it. And it, it was hard, man. It was really hard. And it affects you your whole life life. You know, you don't ever really get over it, even though you certainly can overcome it. And I think I've done a pretty good job of that. And uh, again, that's where my nickname came from. And I just, I celebrate that a lot. But a lot of it comes down to what reason you get bullied is not just because you have a handicap, but because you allow yourself and you think of yourself as inferior. And usually the perceptions you have of yourself, you project onto other people that they have the same feelings about you. And the better you look at yourself, then the better other people look at you too. As touchy feeling as that sounds, it really is the truth. Well, thanks for sharing that. I remember when we first started corresponding by email, I saw the snowman at the bottom. Something about a snowman and a portal. <laughs> Was it uh, from the mind of the snowman through his iPhone portal? Or something? yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's a colorful industry. You know, it's an image driven industry, which is what's so interesting. Why I got into it because it is very image driven, and uh, and again, the handicap certainly helped with being an image you know so it's uh yeah the color more colorful you are in the music business the better the more over exaggerated you are the better you know brian when i was young i didn't know much about elvinism but when i came across a great blues guitar player named johnny winter i tied the two together and so now when people see you playing i don't know if they see the disability of blindness or elvinism but they see a positive role model with your success i hope so um what's really interesting about the common man these days. Like, so for example, Edgar and Johnny Winter, and actually I get I get that reference a lot, obviously, playing saxophone and playing. I play a lot of blues and rock music too, so they get brought up a ton, especially Edgar. You know, with Frankenstein, I think that was his big song, right? Something like that. And then actually there's a famous wrestler, I think, here from uh, Minnesota, the Crusher from the old days. Yep. I get called the Crusher sometimes. <laughs> or Ric Flair, because he was really blonde, you know. But sometimes people don't even associate it with the handicap anymore, because I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, what my real hair color was. And I'm kind of looking at them like, don't you see the hair in my arms and my eye? I couldn't dye all this. Oh, you know, my eyebrows and my my beard and my hair, you know. And I don't know if that's just because people aren't used to seeing albinism still. Or even on stage, they think it's just a look in some ways. Um, some people know. And, Goth. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> And, and actually, I'll even go, like, I, I sometimes I like to, you know, put dye and I'll color my hair for gigs and things like that. So, yeah, it's funny. Some people don't even realize that it's actually, that I even have a disability sometimes. But, uh, and of course, those that do, it's, it's amazing the example that you are for people who don't even realize it. You know, and like, people who have their own struggles or they, they actually see someone with, with a handicap doing maybe either what they do or what they or at least something that, that seems like that. So you hope to be an inspiration to people. And, and I didn't even know that Minnesota, I guess, is the national chapter for albinism capital like Noah or something like that I think because
because I know that the University of Minnesota actually has a research program for people with albinism or something like that. Like uh, when I first moved here, I found that out. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. But I still haven't seen very many people with albinism here at all. Yeah, but it's it's funny how how a lot of people don't even realize it. And you know, every now and then I'll get the, the odd comment of you know, well, oh, people think I'm like 90 or something, like especially I haven't shaved. Which uh, actually, to be honest with you, that actually probably insults me the most because I'm sitting here going like, I don't have any wrinkles. I don't real. I don't look 90. You know, but uh, every now and then you'll still hear that sometimes. Brian. Where can people go to find out more about Brian Powers and his engineering and his sax playing and his music? Um, until I get to the new stuff up, as far as my own personal compositions and things, I do have a SoundCloud that I will be putting up on stillmanband.com. We'll also be going up uh, this year, probably early in the year. And, um, of course, you can always look, at, look me up on Facebook, uh, Brian Powers. Even if you just Google Brian Stillman Powers, you'll find a ton of me everywhere. But um, I play a lot, like, um, every Tuesday down at Shaw's Bar Grill. I play with the new primitives. It's like reggae and New Orleans music. And then, again, I play with Chase and Ovation, which is a Prince tribute band. We play at Bunkers every, every month but we tour the country and internationally with those guys. And then uh, I will be playing with my own band starting this year, the Twin Cities Jazz Fest and places like that. So if you just uh, look me up a lot, you will find me. We'll be sure to put some of those links right in the show notes. Brian, it's really cool that you're able to live out your passion and record and play with such a diverse group of musicians. Yeah, I've been very, very blessed to, uh, I work with a lot of, uh, uh, even my local work isn't even that much. I work with a lot of national and international artists. I just uh, mix uh, four solos on a record with Victor Wooten, who's one of the top five bass players of all time. I guess uh, with me, people expect really good quality of, of sound. Like I'm known for really high fidelity sound. Like everything sounds really three-dimensional, really top-notch. It's uh, national or national level sound. It's it's and I mean, of course I credit my hearing to that, you know, and the, mm-hmm. because of the lack of eyesight, I guess. But so that's kind of what people come to me for is like really, really high high fidelity sound in their projects. Well, Brian, is there anything else you would like to leave our listeners with? Just that, uh, you know, people talk about following your dreams a lot. And I know with, with handicaps in general, our dreams can be can seem really out of reach. And the term following your dreams, though, to me kind of took on a different meaning the older I get. Dreams are great and uh, you want to have hope for the future, but you have to take a very practical approach to your dreams. You can't just think of them as some far off distant land where where things happen to you and you don't have to work hard for them. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into achieving your goals. And especially with disability, we have to work about 30 times harder. But there are resources out there to help. And I've benefited from them all my life in the key pivotal moments of my life. I know that budgets change and sometimes you can't always get what you think you want to get or should get from these services because of uh, constraints of, of regulations of things but those services are there there's a lot of help there's a lot of people who even just want to encourage you and want to help and, and obviously for low vision aids and things and never be afraid to ask for help a lot of us just want to be as independent as we can but you know the things you can achieve faster or even that you didn't know you could achieve you can achieve with help from these services i know brianna has just been just a, a spark of life i know into what i've been doing and even after just i know she's worked with my sister and stuff a ton and, and again it's just just don't be afraid to use the services that are out there that's i guess that's my biggest <laughs> i don't say it like three times but but it's true we're you know we, we're so afraid of looking for help we think it makes us look weak or we think it accentuates our disability but in a lot of ways that help will reduce our disability and yet sometimes we're too you know blinded by trying to be independent that we refuse to ask for it and end up shooting ourselves in the foot so brian i'm sure on your next album we'll be able to look down in the credits in the small braille and read thank you state services for the blind oh well (laughs) if there were braille the album yes absolutely um, no, but there's definitely a, th- a thank you or, or eight <laughs> coming for them because of, uh, again, they helped me with both schoolings that I've had and they helped me with uh, studying up the new studio. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Brian, with all your engineering, mixing, recording, playing, gigging, all that, doesn't productivity feel good? It is. You know, it gives you a sense of, I hate using the word normalcy, but uh, to be able to really achieve a career and to do anything, like even if it's working a reception desk or something, something that brings money into your life that you have earned certainly gives you a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, productivity, a sense of uh, just accomplishment. Absolutely. You know, I remember thinking about what I wanted to be when I grew up or what I wanted to do after I, you know, gained some skills and confidence. What did I want to do? And my answer to myself is passion. Chase, passion. Well, if you don't have that, don't get into any field that you're in. Just like my daughter, for example, uh, she likes to play basketball, so she plays high school ball. 
it was a passion for her as far as a communal aspect, but it's not something that she practiced and did every day of her life until midnight every night, sitting there with a the basketball in her hand, you know what I mean? You're only gonna succeed as far as the effort that you put into something, right? If you don't love something, you're not gonna put in the effort that you should put in to master that something. Because to really master something is something you feel called to do or something that you do, whether you get paid for it or not, you do it because you love it. And that kind of intensity only comes from something you love. That's the only way you can get really good at something that you love or at anything in general. So if you don't really love what you're doing, you just, you shouldn't do it because you, you're not, you're not going to put in the effort required to master to be at the top of that game. And the only people that are going to really be successful in that particular field are people who are willing to put in that extra time and that extra effort because they love it. Passion. Love it. Love it. Brian, I really want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your day and coming down to the studios here and recording this for the Blind Abilities listeners. It's been great talking to you. I'm looking forward to your studio in Uptown and going to come down there and check it out. Sounds like a really good time. So thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff, for doing this. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear it. When we share what we see through each other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge the the gap between the the limited expectations and the reality reality of blind abilities. abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at Blind Abilities, download our app from the App Store, Blind Abilities, that's two words, or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.